Well, good morning. Now, please find a Philippians chapter 1 in your Bibles. Uh, for any visitors, uh, our Pastor Mike is away today, so you pretty much promise within the next 30 minutes you'll be really looking forward to seeing Mike back. So uh, let's begin reading Philippians chapter 1, beginning verse 27. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then, whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in the one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel, without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved, and that by God. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him, since you are going through the same struggle you saw I had and now hear that I still have. Father, thank you for your word. We pray that you will bless us in these few moments we have together. You will speak to our hearts, help us obey what you give us to do. May we treasure Christ above all things. We ask it for, in his name for his sake. Amen. Well, I'm often amazed at the unity that we have at ICP. I marvel at it. I sat at the retreat just looking around and just amazed and so encouraged, blessed by it. Uh, here's a community of people from well over 40 different countries, different confessional backgrounds, yet not consumed by those differences, but really experiencing a remarkable and, and just really sweet level of unity. I, I really appreciate it. And I think of churches in my home country, people who are largely from the same area, same language, same culture, same ethnicity, same life experiences, and they can't get along. You know, it's just uh, unfathomable. So it really is precious and it's sweet. And it's not by accident. It is something that we will have to be intentional to maintain. Uh, I think the church at Philippi may have been somewhat similar to ICP. This was a church in a city that was I had very few Jewish people in it, not enough for a synagogue, so at least we're not 10 men. That was the, the rule in those days. So there's no synagogue, few Jewish people, so largely Gentile congregation that is from the nations, as is ICP. Uh, it was located in Philippi, the city that was strategic and important, so it drew people from a lot of different nations there. So I think we had a makeup maybe quite similar, you know, kind of dynamics similar to what we have at ICP. And they were generous, they were missions-minded, they were a real support and encouragement to Paul in his ministry. So it just seemed like a really healthy church, right? I marvel at what I see here, and yet there's a, a melancholy side of me, a, maybe a, a, a bit of a pessimist, you know, I've, I've said it before, but you know, the optimist sees the glass half full, the pessimist sees the glass half empty, and I tend to see the glass is broken, and I've cut my hand on the, on the shard. So... Uh, I do have a pessimistic evil twin, um, but I see this sweet unity, and I think, how long can this last? How long until we are consumed by some issue, till some conflict breaks out, till we come under some kind of attack? I hope it never happens, okay? I really do, and I pray, and you should pray, we should be praying uh, that it doesn't happen, and yet the reality is any church that is experiencing unity is a threat to the enemy. And we can expect and should be prepared for some kind of spiritual attack. I think it's inevitable. And this can come from different directions. The enemy generally attacks people through deception and temptation and accusation. And that can bring great harm to the church. He attacks the church through false teaching. He attacks the church through persecution Conflict over lesser issues, things like that. You've, you've seen those kinds of things. And I wonder if Paul had similar thoughts about the church at Philippi. Because he had suffered when he was there. You read the story, it's in Acts 16. He was beaten, he was thrown into jail. The Lord worked in all of that, but he called it shameful treatment. And it was. And he knew that if they weren't experiencing that already, they would at some point. They didn't have the same problem that the Galatians had or the Corinthians had. They didn't get the rebukes uh, that those churches did. But... We can see that there were, as we read the letter, we can see there were threats on the horizon. And I believe Paul is writing to help them keep focused on the gospel for the times that they were facing or would be facing. 
And these words to them, they're essential for us as well, if we as a church are to remain united in Christ, to maintain this sweet gospel-centered unity. Uh, If we are to maintain that in these days of confusion and idolatry and deception, because it is all around us. The gospel was the key to the Philippians' unity, and it is for ours as well. So let's look um, at these verses. In verse 27, Paul says, first, whatever happens. And he means whatever happens to me. So we need to get a little context because in the verses just above this, he, we are aware that he's in prison and he is facing a possible death sentence. He does not know how it will go. He will either be executed, which means to be with Christ, or he will be released. And that means fruitful ministry for Christ. So either way, he is content, but he doesn't know. So he says to them, you know, for me to live as Christ, to die as gain, I'd love to depart, be with Jesus. But if I stay, it'll be fruitful ministry for Jesus, laboring for your joy in the faith, progress in the faith. But he says, whatever happens, live, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. His focus is on Christ, and that's what he wants them to have. And he uses this word for conduct yourselves. It's, it's not the normal word for conduct. He uses, usually, usually uses a word like walk, but here he uses this word that refers to the way citizens live and the way they fulfill their responsibilities. It's no doubt because Philippi was very proud of its status as a Roman colony. Their Roman citizenship was a huge issue to them. And I think it was, in fact, a a part of their identity. And I think he is challenging them to have an identity, not so much in their Roman citizenship, but in Christ. Their, Their Roman citizenship may have been where they found meaning and identity and purpose, but Paul, I think by using this one word, just says, look this, your identity, your meaning, your purpose in life has to come not from your citizenship in in any nation, but in Christ. Uh, That is something that cannot be taken away. So this is our identity. We We belong to Christ. We are citizens. As he says in chapter 3 and verse 20, he reminds them, you are, we are citizens of heaven. And by that, he means citizens of the age to come. We are part of a, a larger human story that involves creation and fall and curse and death, but resurrection and renewal. And we look forward to heaven, yes, but beyond that, we look forward to resurrection and life on a new heavens and a new earth. And that's where we belong. And by coming to Christ, we belong to that age. We don't belong to this age. So when somebody asks you how the world's treating you, it's okay to say, like, I don't belong. (laughs) Because you don't belong. You belong to Christ. You don't belong to this age. That's that's why everything is different. And sometimes it brings us into conflict with this age. This present age reflects beauty and blessing because it was created by God, but also brokenness because it is fallen into sin and rebellion. And this is what John has in mind when he warns us against loving the world in, in 1 John chapter 2, verse 16, he says, everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. He says, don't love the world. Don't, don't be in bondage to these things. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. There's confusion in our day because people not only follow these kinds of desires, but now they see that as their identity. That's who they are. And if you don't affirm that behavior, following those lusts and desires and pride, it's interpreted as rejection of them as a person. And in their minds, love equals affirmation. But scripture says love doesn't rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices in the truth. So we love people too much to affirm destructive behavior. Yet it's perceived as hate. Well, what a great time to be alive and have the gospel, right? I mean, what crazy, confusing, difficult days. They're made for the gospel. It reminds me of a friend who's been a missionary here. He's moving to a city in the U.S. to church plant and, or to pastor a church. And he said, he said, yeah, unemployment's terrible. Crime is terrible. Everything's terrible. He said, it's awesome. <laughs> great opportunity for the gospel. I can't wait to get there. I haven't heard from him in decades. I trust he's well. So... But so living, conducting yourself as a citizen of the, of the age to come. But then he says to do this in a worthy way. And let's think about that, that word worthy. Because we understand that none of us will ever be worthy of the gospel. We're not worthy of salvation. It's not something we can earn. It is a gift given, not 
not because of what we deserve. In fact, in spite of what we deserve, we deserve the very opposite. And yet, this is what God gives us in the gospel. But we need to ask, what does he mean then to live in a worthy manner? I think a good synonym for that is just consistent. That is, to live in a way that is consistent with the gospel. Let the gospel have its full effect in your life. Let it work its way through every area of your lives. And let it have its full effect. And that's okay. That's not bad. But we also need to remember that the idea of worthy or worth has inherently the idea of value in it. Because in the gospel, we value Christ. We live consistently with the gospel because we value Christ. We treasure Christ above everything in this life and in this age. We find our hearts completely satisfied in him, a way that nothing else can. I read this recently by Michael Reeves, president of Union School of Theology in, in Cardiff. Recommend anything Michael Reeves has written, okay? Full endorsement. He says this, Jesus has satisfied the mind and heart of the infinite God for eternity. Just think about that. Jesus has satisfied the mind and heart of the infinite God for eternity. It's astounding. If the Father can be infinitely and eternally satisfied in him, that is in Jesus, then he must be overwhelmingly all-sufficient for us in every situation for all eternity. I'm, I'm learning <laughs> to embrace that and live that out. But that is who Christ is. He is so worthy, so good. He satisfies the heart of God the Father forever. He can satisfy our hearts, your heart as well. So treasure him, value him. That's a part of what it means to be, to be acknowledging his worth. And this is something we have to internalize for ourselves. Paul wants them to treasure Christ, to, to live worthy of the gospel, whether he's with them and sees for himself, or that is, he survives the imprisonment and is able to go back, or if he's away from them and is only able to hear about them. The thing is, they are doing this regardless of whether he is there or not. That's a good indication that, that they've learned to treasure Christ, whether Paul is there or not. You know, it's easy when you know, Paul's around. Yeah, we, we all look better. <laughs> we'll dress up, look nice, behave, right? But when they do that when he's absent, that's a sign that it's really gotten to the heart level. They obey when he's not around. Any parent knows what this is like, right? As your children grow, they make choices. Every once in a while, they make a good choice when you're not there to make sure they make a good choice. It happens every now and then. <laughs> not as often as we like, but it happens. Okay, don't look at me like that. Your kids are just like mine. So... But now the specifics, what does it mean for, what does it look like for us to conduct ourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel, to live like citizens of the age to come, even though we live in the present age? He gives us three things in this text, it's standing firm in one spirit, striving together for the faith of the gospel, and suffering courageously. Now, why these things? You know, why not... Read your Bible. Why not pray? Why not give generously? Why not go to church? Said, why? He doesn't say any of those things that are so basic, right? No, he is preparing them for the inevitable spiritual attack, I believe. It is what Paul was facing. It's what the Philippians were facing or would face. It's what we face to varying degrees in our day. There are threats from many directions, and some are external to the church. Some are internal. External threats have a way of finding their way inside. So here are some of the threats that Paul mentions just in this letter. There are external threats, of the external threat of opposition and persecution. He mentions this in a couple of ways. One we've already talked about in chapter 1 where he talks about his imprisonment and potential martyrdom. He eventually was martyred. He, wasn't, he was spared. He was released after this imprisonment, ministered for a while, was eventually imprisoned again, and uh, eventually martyred in Rome. But... Um, that imprisonment arose from Jewish persecution. Uh, later, there would be persecution from the Roman Empire. All throughout the Roman Empire, Christians would, would be marred, suffered, would suffer, and would be martyred for the gospel's sake. Suffering for the gospel's sake has been the norm, really, for all of human history, or let's say God's people's suffering has been the norm for human history. Suffering, especially as the gospel has advanced to the nation, has been the norm. 
I will confess I've suffered very little beyond a little mocking here and there. Uh, I don't, can't think of much. But here in this part of the world, even a, a generation ago, uh, where some of our brothers and sisters suffered greatly, some of you come from countries where Christians are persecuted terribly. It may surprise you that more Christians were martyred in the 20th century than in the previous 19 combined. It's happening. I don't mean to make you paranoid. We just need to be sober, need to be gospel-centered. Then in chapter 2, we see that the Philippians lived in what Paul calls a warped and crooked generation. And simply by holding firmly to the gospel, that is, by standing, they were like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. So our very existence exposes the darkness around us. We see stars because of the dark sky. You know, stars are still shining right now. We don't see them. The sky gets dark, we see the stars. The darker it gets, the better we see the stars, right? And the darker our times become, the more brightly we shine. We can't help it, and the darkness doesn't like it. And we just, not, not to be paranoid, but sober. So the external threat, opposition, persecution, but then there are internal threats we see in this letter. In chapter 1, there is personal animosity from other Christians. Paul had said his imprisonment had actually given boldness to many other Christians, and they were sharing the gospel in ways that were, that were great. But he said some were doing this out of selfish ambition, not sincerely supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I am in chains. Isn't that awful? <laughs> Really, it's like you know, knowing that Paul was in prison, knowing he could do nothing about it, and they are preaching the gospel in some way, hoping, hoping to stir up trouble for him. What is Paul's response? Don't care. <laughs> as long as they're preaching the gospel, I don't care what they say or what they want to do to me. They were bold, but their aim was to cause trouble for for Paul. And you have seen this in church. We see it sometimes in power struggles that happens in churches, organizations, things like that. It, it happens. So there's, there's personal animosity that comes from other Christians sometimes, confessional beliefs, differences, those kinds of things. Then uh, a second internal threat comes from false teachers. And there are really two extremes that we see in Philippians. One is in the first part of chapter 3, and I'll call it legalism. There, Paul warns them in chapter 3, verse 2, against what he calls the dogs the evil workers, the false circumcision. These were, we commonly call these Judaizers. They, they claimed to follow Christ, but they insisted that people who were not Jewish become Jewish before they follow Christ because Jesus being Jewish, um, so they were expected to accept the law and specifically the right of circumcision sort of typified in that. Paul's response is the truly circumcised, the, the heart circumcised, God's true people are those who trust and delight in Christ and not in their own performance. And we find our unity threatened by legalism, insisting on secondary rules, picky rules. Um, I've seen it in Eastern Europe, former communist countries where we've lived for 29 years. And the bar of discipleship raised because church is infiltrated by secret police. Then the communism falls and sometimes our brothers and sisters haven't, took them a while to realize, oh yeah, <laughs> we, we don't have to, Act like they're secret police infiltrating our services anymore. So, but there was, we saw it especially in the 90s when we moved to Romania, a lot of, a lot of legalism there, focus on performance, that kind of thing. And the gospel does its work, it's, but that's, that is a threat to the church. It shifts our attention from the gospel, from Christ, to our performance. And then the other internal threat with false teaching is license. That's toward the end of chapter 3. Verses 17 to 19. In verse 18, he says, I have often told you before and now tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach. That is their appetites, their lust, whatever they desire. And their glory is in their shame. The thing is, these appear to have been in the church, teaching within the church. So we have these two extremes that we're warned against, the legalism and the license. So these had cast off all moral restraint. And casting off moral restraint seems to be a, a virtue in modern times. Um, some try to reconcile this with following Christ, but it's just like John says, you can't love the world and love the Father. It, it is impossible. So there's conflict. There's, um, there's the internal threat of personal animosity, internal threat 
of false teaching, but then there's a third, and that is conflict over secondary matters. We see that in chapter 4. He says, I plead with Yodia, I plead with Sintike, to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, my true companion, help these women since they have contended at my side for the cause of the gospel, along with Clement, the rest of my co-workers whose names are in the book of life. Two sisters in the church in conflict over something. We don't know what, but you know, that's not what you want your name written in the Bible for, right? <laughs> <You know? laughs> Two sisters are... Evidently a secondary matter, right? Not, not gospel-centered. Both, you know, names are written in the book of life. They, book of life. They've striven with me. They, they're committed to the cause of the gospel, but they are not getting along. You know, I was a pastor. I had something similar to this happen. I wasn't about to get in the middle of that. And two of my widows were at odds. And they're both with the Lord, and it's all good. So, uh, yeah, fun times. Um, So I said earlier that Paul gives us three things to do to conduct ourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. And uh, following this uh, brief introduction we just had, we'll look at those a little more closely. Um, First, he says, standing firm in one spirit. So stand is a military term. It means to stand your ground, but stand your ground together. You're not alone. We're standing our ground together. If you've read books, watched stories, movies, military, with involved military battles. It's all about gaining ground, recovering ground, expanding territory. It's really a little different for us. We're not about expanding. We're not, we're not talking about numerical growth, expanding our reach, anything like that. We are simply talking about standing our ground in the gospel. When we face threats to unity, to the gospel, we treasure Christ, we trust, we trust him, we cling to him, the hope he gives us in the gospel. This is what Martin Luther did. The Diet of Worms, 1521, a little over 500 years ago, he's told by the Roman Catholic Church that he has to recant his writings and teachings or be branded a heretic and be burned at the stake. And with his life on the line, he said this, I neither can nor will retract anything, for it cannot be safe or honest for a Christian to speak against his conscience. Here I stand. I cannot do otherwise. God help me. Amen. And and they had put this on Martin Luther in this this conference, this assembly called the Diet of, in the city called Worms. Let's say that okay, Frank? Worms, is that close? Okay, thank you. Um, And uh, at least I didn't say worms, right? So that's just good. Um, But uh, he asked for a break, basically. The, the session, the assembly broke for the afternoon. He had the whole night to think through, what will I say to this? It's not like the, the Hollywood movie type that would, he marches in and, and screams this. This is, this is Luther humble, I, I think fearful in some way, understanding the, the cost of what he was about to say. But this he said, here I stand. You know, bold, bold or not, here I stand. Loud or silent, here I stand. Stand on the gospel. You may be physically alone in in that time of opposition as you may have to contend or strive for the gospel in your own life, but just know that we are a body. If one suffers, the rest suffer. So we we stand together. The second thing is striving together for the faith of the gospel. So stand is a military term. Striving is a sports term. It's the word, the word that he uses here is the word we get our word athletics from, and it has the, a prefix to it that, that adds the sense of together. So striving together as one. So as a church, we strive together as one, united in and for the faith of the gospel. That's one reason we celebrate the Lord's Supper regularly, because that has a unique way of refocusing us as a church on the gospel. This is where my hope is in life, yes, life, life to come, is in the life, death, resurrection of Christ. Now, when he talks about the faith of the gospel here, he's not just talking about primarily our personal faith, what, what we believe intellectually in the heart, but he's talking about the content of the gospel, the faith, uh, the faith of the gospel, not faith in Christ, but faith, the faith of the gospel. Sometimes that word is used to describe the content of what we believe. So I think what he's saying here is we must be faithful 
to the message. We must be faithful to the gospel. We must declare it. We must declare it faithfully. We must declare it clearly. We must declare it joyfully and winsomely. Uh, and if you can fire on all of those cylinders, if you can do all of that well, blessed are you. Um, winsomely may be the toughest. Huh? Sometimes we can be really abrasive with the gospel. That's, that's not what we should do, right? Joyfully, faithfully, clearly, but also winsomely. Because the gospel addresses the hunger that any heart has, right? Sometimes striving for the gospel means that we have to find new ways to express the gospel clearly to address a specific issue today that wasn't an issue in the past. So people, it seems like to me, people keep finding what look like new ways to rebel against God. So we're often in response mode. We, this this um, rebe- form of rebellion surfaces and we say, well, no, that's, that's actually not, not, the gospel addresses that desire this way. That's okay. That's We're finding new ways to express the gospel. The gospel doesn't change, but we are just trying to make it clear. And we strive together. That is, as a body, as a body from over 40 different countries, from multiple confessional backgrounds, we strive together for the gospel. In case you haven't put it together, I am an American, so um, I will confess what everybody is already thinking. We Americans have a terrible habit of uh, dropping in to other places with our solution-oriented, pragmatic things already mapped out, and we've got the answers. And we have been incredibly arrogant, and I apologize for, on behalf of myself and all of my fellow citizens. Um, It is true. I've I've had some people say I'm the first American that's acknowledged that to them. (laughs) So it's like, well, that's part of my preconceived plan to, you know. uh, That was terrible. Like a joke, not funny at all. Okay, so... (laughs) I have learned, as I said, we've lived Central and Eastern Europe for 29 years, and I am so thankful for what I have learned from coming together before the Word of God with my brothers and sisters from different parts of the world to hear their insights, to hear how the Lord speaks to them through His Word and to me through them as we interact with the Word together. I've learned a great deal, and I am grateful. We strive together for the gospel, not alone. That's part of what this means. We need each other. We do. We need each other. Some of you come from highly persecuted peoples, and we need to hear about your experiences. We need to hear, and and a host of other circumstances that give you a voice and a unique understanding of Scripture, that that, things that, that I would miss. Okay. Third thing, suffering courageously. So the third way we conduct ourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel is by suffering courageously. Paul is emphatic here, in no way frightened by opponents. Now the threat is real, okay? There is something to fear. My, it's always some kind of loss that, that this age would, would challenge us with. But we cannot be, we are not in bondage to fear. We suffer courageously because, as he says in verse 29, both faith in Christ and suffering are gracious gifts of God. Now, Paul uses a word here that emphasizes the the gracious nature of the gift. It's like a grant. To give you an example, in uh, the year 1676, King Charles II of England, only slightly older than King Charles III. um, (laughs) Thank you for that. Okay. 1676, King Charles II of England issued a land grant in which he granted to, quote, our dearest brother James, Duke of York, his heirs and assigns all that part of the mainland of New England, which is the northeastern part of the U.S., in case you don't know, what is now today the U.S. Well, that is quite valuable land today. As a good colonist, I'm glad to say James doesn't own it anymore. Sometimes I would consider giving it back, but that's all right. Though it's valuable, we have received something in Christ much more valuable. We have received faith in Christ, the ability to believe in Christ, but also suffering. And our impulse is to say, thank you, God, for granting me faith. Thank you, God, for granting me the ability to believe in Christ. And... Thank you for suffering, I guess. <laughs> uh, 
what's up with that? <laughs> Did you slip that one in there? What's, what's going on here? Well, he says in verse 28 that this opposition to the gospel, it is a sign, the persecution, these, these threats that we've talked about, these are a sign. They are a sign to us of salvation, but they are a sign to those who oppose the gospel of their own destruction. So I believe from this that suffering works in two ways. One, that it has a way of clarifying for us, of, of showing us what's important in life. So it has a way of clarifying for us how worthy and how precious Jesus is. And that is evidence to us of grace, that our faith is genuine. That is, of, of pressing on through suffering, persecution, opposition, rejection, loss, and other things. Again, Michael Reeves said it quite well. My own experience has been that suffering has always taught me far more than ease. I don't always understand what I'm going through at the time or why, but as I look back, I am so grateful for what the Lord has led me through. Trial has left me less attached to old addictions, more contented, so much more joyful and free. That's what suffering does. The second thing suffering does and this is focused on the, those who oppose and persecute. It's a sign to them that we have, have gained possession of something that is of infinite value. So that whatever loss they threaten us with, it has no, no hold on us. So Paul says, in effect, when you are threatened with loss of income, reputation of work, relationship, freedom, even life, I want you to be so confident that those who oppose you will be forced to reflect what is different about this person? How can they face such loss with joy and not fear? Now, as uh, the, the early Christian martyr Polycarp said just before he was martyred, he said this to the Roman proconsul, You threaten me with fire which burns for an hour and is then extinguished. But you know nothing of the fire of the coming judgment and eternal punishment reserved for the ungodly. So... Why are you waiting? Bring on whatever you want. Yeah, wow. I read that and I think, I think a couple things. One, I think I am really pathetic. <laughs> the, the, more seriously, I think if I find myself in that position, God grant me grace in that moment. And I trust that he will. Because I do not want to embarrass the Lord in those moments. And I, I dare say, for, for Polycarp, for anyone, the great moments like this are not a great moment out of the blue. They are often the culmination of many smaller moments. So what that, a thought like that causes me to do is look at my life now and say, let me, help me make good choices now, wise choices, godly choices, gospel-centered, live by the gospel now so that when that time comes, I may find the courage by God's grace. So we can suffer courageously because we don't suffer alone. We've got each other. We're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. They have run their race. They are now, as Hebrews 12 tells us, they are now sort of in the stands cheering us on in the same race they have once been on. They are cheering us, encouraging us to stand firm in the gospel. So Paul could say in verse 30, you are experiencing the same kind of a conflict that you've seen in me, heard in me, you know that I continue to experience. So we suffer Joyously and courageously. Doesn't mean suffering isn't painful, but it is temporary. And we're not alone because we have a God who not only does not abandon us, but he suffers with us. He, he enters into this with us. There is no religion that has a God who suffers and weeps with his suffering and weeping people. There is no one like him. So... As a church, I hope we hear this today, to live worthy, that is to live in a way that is consistent with the gospel, to live like you belong to the age to come, even though you live completely in this age. Your heart has gone ahead of you to the future with Christ. You stand firm together with the gospel. We don't compromise. We don't compromise the gospel. We strive together for the gospel in the face of attack and threat, we labor to share it faithfully, clearly, joyfully, winsomely, and fearlessly. And we suffer courageously. If others oppose you, rejoice, 
Know that the Lord is at work in you. He is at work in them. And if you are here today and none of this seems to make much sense to you, hear this good news that Jesus Christ has died and he has risen again to bring us forgiveness and freedom and life to sinners like you and like me. And it would be our joy to point you to him that you might also become a citizen of the age to come, that you might learn to treasure and value Christ above all things. Follow him faithfully and be a citizen of the age to come. If, if you have interest, curious, want to know more, please speak to one of us after this service today. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so very much for these moments together before your word. Please help us. We pray you would seal into our hearts whatever you have for each of us. Let us be faithful with what you give us. We ask this in Jesus' name, for his sake, among the nations. Amen.